Thank you. All right. Hello, Craft. Um, it's great to be here. I've always uh, had a lot of friends speak at Craft. I thought this is where the cool kids come to speak, so it's exciting to be invited myself and get to be here. Uh, it's been a, an exciting week for me. I've spoke at a conference in Germany earlier this week, and apparently I was actually holographically uh, displayed in the overflow room, which is definitely a first for me. Uh, I'd never heard of that before, and now I'm speaking in a tent, so it's been a pretty cool week. Um, and so what I'd like to really take you through today, uh, like the airlines like to say, we know you have a choice uh, when you fly, so thanks for choosing us. I know you have a lot of choices at Craft, great speakers, great content. So uh, hopefully you're interested somewhat in container runtimes. I'll try and keep your interest for 35 minutes or so on where container runtimes uh, have gone the last few years and, uh, and what's happening in that space. So you've already heard about who I am. Uh, probably the most important thing is not so much uh, my role, but the fact that I've been very involved in open source uh, the last five years in the container ecosystem. So starting with the Docker engine, becoming a contributor, becoming a maintainer, uh, then uh, helping with the Open Container Initiative, which we'll talk a little bit about, and then most recently being a maintainer in the Container D project, which is a container runtime um, that Docker began and has grown into a, a community activity that we'll talk a lot more about. Um, so I bet you've probably used Docker or else you probably wouldn't have come to this talk or if you're interested in containers. So how many folks have used Docker in some way? Um, great, yeah, so my expectations were correct. Um, and you're probably using Kubernetes or at least you're interested. How many are, are dabbling in Kubernetes using it in some way? All right, so we have the smart people here. You've already uh, engaged with these technologies. Um, you know about them. but. Uh, to, to state the extremely obvious, Kubernetes is just an orchestrator. And what I mean by that is that Kubernetes doesn't run your containers. It doesn't have a container runtime. When you start a pod, when you deploy a service, there has to be a container runtime there somewhere to do that work. And so since the dawn of Kubernetes, that has been the Docker engine. And as Docker matured over the years and became a stack of components, which initially uh, involved Docker calling container D, which called into run C, the open container initiatives, um, sort of basic core runtime that came out of the Docker code base uh, originally. And so this has been sort of the state of how Kubernetes runs your containers um, for a number of years. And so there's a component called the Docker shim, and when the kubelet wanted to actually do work uh, through that, uh, Docker API, the Docker shim, knew how to call into Docker, start containers, stop containers, get the logs, uh, set up all the appropriate uh, namespaces, and so on. But uh, an interesting thing happened along the way. It's kind of silly to call it the runtime wars. If you weren't necessarily involved, you probably didn't care. You probably didn't even know that there were sort of detractors from Docker and, and their direction. There were people with different ideas about container runtimes. There were people who felt maybe Docker shouldn't be sort of the, uh, the arbiter of where containers went in the future, even though they were obviously extremely popular as a technology. But out of that, we got the Open Container Initiative, which again was a sort of vendor uh, neutral foundation under which we could all agree on a couple things. What is a container? What is a container image? And then most recently, uh, how do we talk to a registry and, and pull or push images? And so all three of those areas have now been standardized under the OCI. We're actually in the middle of, of uh, finalizing the specification for the registry protocol. Again, if you've talked to uh, JFrog Artifactory Registry or Docker Hub or many other registries, um, you've kind of expected that, that it all just works, and that's because everyone simply adopted Docker's API. That's now being standardized, uh, and so it's not just a Docker thing, but it's an OCI thing. And so that led to having a, a whole set of runtimes, whether you like Docker or Containerd or Creo, which came out of Red Hat and is used in OpenShift. 
or whether you're interested in some of the newer um, kind of lightweight virtualization technologies like Kata containers or Amazon announced Firecracker last year or Google's Gvisor or if you're in the academic or high performance computing space you may have heard of Singularity and there's even a few others, Charlie Cloud. So we have a plurality of runtimes, we have a plurality of registries. Thankfully we're in a pretty good space where the OCI has standardized that, all our tools can work together even if we disagree about what tools we like. And that is true on Linux and Windows because of Microsoft's involvement in the container space as well. And so that's all great. Uh, but it led to an issue with the Kubernetes community in that now it would be hard to continue adding interfaces in Kubernetes for your preferred container runtime. So again, I showed you that Docker shim that called into the Docker engine. Um, when uh, Rocket came out, so CoreOS had created an alternative to, to Docker called Rocket. Um, and so there had been a Rocket NetEase project that again added code similar to the Docker shim that knew how to talk to Rocket and, and for those container interactions. And so the, the Kubernetes community said, this is crazy, we're not going to keep adding code and kind of adding all kinds of, of tight, connect, tight coupling with container runtimes. We're going to create an interface that if you want to be a container runtime that runs underneath Kubernetes, you just implement this interface. And so there's a blog post you can go read late 2016. This was announced. Uh, it showed up in Kubernetes 1.5 um, and again started to be uh, adopted at that point. And so really the CRI is, is somewhat of a division of duties, right? So Kubernetes owns a, a whole lot of orchestration tasks dealing with CNI plugins, your networking, where to place pods, how to deal with you know, custom resources, CRDs, uh, and obviously the API sitting above that, the whole Kubernetes API space. And so the CRI effectively divides off just the container interaction. So the CRI specifies um, all of the things you would need to implement to do standard pod and container lifecycle ac actions like start and stop and pause and unpause and delete. Image management, because obviously when I place uh, a pod on a node, it has to go talk to a registry and pull images. Actually, I meant to edit this. We, we don't push images in Kubernetes. Uh, so it's pull and, and what's the status of an image? Is it, are all the layers here? Is it ready to run? And then all kinds of interesting container interactions have to be supported by the CRI so that Kubernetes API interactions can work. Like, can you give me my logs? What's the status of my container? Uh, can I attach to it? Can you, I need to exec into a container. And so the CRI, to implement the CRI API, you need to implement all these features. Um, and so today we actually have a plurality of runtimes that do that. Um, and this, gra this uh, chart is meant to be pretty, so it's not perfect, uh, meaning that there are layers underneath this. So if you think about the very first uh, entry there with Docker, you'll remember from my earlier picture that there's actually containerd and run c under that. And so the call stack from kubelet down to the container runtime is quite deep in Docker. Uh, so containerd, I'm going to talk quite a bit more about, but we have a CRI implementation that drives containerd, and again, run c sits below that. Uh, Creo that I mentioned from Red Hat, uh, and OpenShift land drives run c directly. And then we'll talk a little bit about the V2 shim. And so this is as Containerd is matured and there's been interest in other sort of non-native uh, Linux container technology, like I mentioned Kata or Firecracker or Nabla or Gvisor. There's now an ability to plug into Containerd directly, not just through a run C replacement, but to actually have more direct management of, for, for example, lightweight hypervisors. And then most recently, the HPC community um, through Singularity implemented a CRI and they also made their, their Singularity runtime OCI compliant. And so there are a mix of CR run, CRI runtimes out there. And uh, again, today you can plug any of these in. For example, if you, were, if you were spinning up your own cluster and knew how to customize the way the kubelet started, you could point to a specific container runtime and, and where, to, where uh, the uh, socket is that you can talk to its gRPC API. 
And at that point, that kubelet would start using that runtime. And so that's kind of where we are today. Um, I'm not going to read everything on this chart. There's obviously a lot of information here. I'm going to talk mostly about Containerd because I'm biased. That's the project I work on, so we're going to talk about Containerd. And it's also the one we've adopted in IBM for our Kubernetes uh, cloud offering. Uh, so, so we'll talk about that quite a bit. I've already mentioned Creo uh, from Red Hat uh, that's used in OpenShift. So I believe this week is Red Hat Summit and they just announced uh, OpenShift 4.0, and Creo, will, I think, will be the default runtime, again, removing their reliance on the full Docker engine. And then I talked some about sort of these other concepts. So these are slightly unique concepts, uh, different than using Run C to drive pure Linux containers. Um, and so if you heard of Intel Clear containers in the past few years, or the Hyper.sh, project, those have merged under the name Kata Containers using KVM, QMU, um, and can be driven by both Creo and Containerd. Um, Amazon open sourced a new project. They announced this last fall at reInvent. Again, Firecracker is another idea on lightweight virtualization. They plan to use it under uh, Lambda as the engine. Uh, and again, it's the same idea of better isolation through a hypervisor. Uh, but it uses a Rust-based VMM that Google wrote initially. And again, they've written direct plugins to Containerd to drive Firecracker as your Kubernetes runtime. And if you're going to KubeCon in a few weeks, I will actually try and demo all of these in a talk where I'm just going to spin through every CRI runtime, which was a really silly idea, but I thought it might get accepted, and it did. So now I actually have to do it. But um, so that'll be interesting. I'll try and actually compare and contrast why you might use some of these. I don't think we'll have enough time to talk all about pros and cons, but I'll talk some about that as we talk about Containerd. But at this point, you might be thinking, why do I even care? Why do I want to know about different runtimes that I could use under Kubernetes? And in some ways, uh, you're right. If you're an application developer, if you're just using somebody's service like Amazon or IBM or Google, uh, or Azure, you know, the, the benefits of having this pluggable within Kubernetes is mostly a benefit for operators. You know, so some efficiency about whether Containerd uses less memory than Docker, or is easier to manage, or has a better life cycle. You know, these are operational concerns that a cloud provider, or if you're, you know, building up your own clusters, you might actually care about choosing a specific runtime. Um, but I'm going to cheat and steal a, t a tweet from Kelsey Hightower, who's, at least in my little container -y world, is quite famous developer advocate from Google. Um, he said, treating containers like a black box will eventually leave you in the dark. And I'm slightly editing it uh, with some creative license that's saying, treating container runtimes like a black box will eventually leave you in the dark. So I think there's value, uh, even if you're not making that choice, to at least understand some of the trade-offs or why uh, an operator might choose that. And so maybe it's good to think about what do I need from a container runtime? If I'm going to use Kubernetes, um, and, I'm, and I'm, it's going to be my decision or my company's decision to select a runtime, obviously performance and stability are going to be key. That's usually true with all our software choices. We want something that performs well, that's stable, that doesn't crash. But optionally, you might care about things like some of these lightweight hypervisors. You might care about choosing something that offers you better isolation because you have workloads that are untrusted. And the Kubernetes API has been maturing to even give you those options. So in Kubernetes 1.14, uh, there's something called runtime class. And you can actually specify this pod. I want to use this runtime. And you can actually have multiple runtimes available on your nodes. Um, and then, of course, security is tantamount. Um, again, containers themselves provide most of that, but the runtime may expose that in certain ways or do it in a better way than others. And then, obviously, having something that's used broadly gives you, uh, again, hopefully, a, a sense that other people have found it to be performant and stable. And then maybe you care about multi-architecture support. Maybe like IBM, you have multiple CPU architectures to care about. And so you need a runtime that's supported maybe on ARM or PowerPC or System Z mainframes in the case of IBM. 
So again, I told you I'm biased, I'll be up front. Um, I think container D is the core runtime that many people are using. We're gonna look at some of the adoption uh, characteristics of it today. Um, so I'm gonna spend the next few minutes just kind of giving you a little bit of foundational information about container D uh, to help you kind of see where it fits in the ecosystem. Um, it was created back in 2016 around the same time as the Open Container Initiative. So as Docker took that core code that became Run C, like how to actually talk to the Linux syscalls to set up a container, to set up the C groups and the namespaces, as that code was broken out into Run C, um, some engineers at Docker said, hey, we should create like a Run C manager, a simple process that just knows how to start and stop Run C processes. And then the Docker engine will just use that tool um, to manage those processes. So that was the sort of starting point of Container D. In, uh, also at the end of 2016, um, after there had been a lot of kind of heightened tensions around Docker the company, Docker the open source project, and some of its consumers, um, in late 2016, several of us uh, in talks with Google and, and Red Hat and Microsoft and Docker, including IBM, we said we really need, we need this code base to be more of a core runtime that doesn't have all the opinions of the Docker engine, and can we have it sit somewhere external to Docker as far as how it's governed, how the open source project is managed. And so it was late 2016 that we had a press release. I wrote a blog post at the time about Containerd being a core container runtime vendor neutral for the cloud, and by March of 2017, uh, Docker had agreed to donate it to the CNCF, and that's when we began life as a CNCF project. And then through 2018, we had uh, several releases as we sort of increased usage and, and, and uh, dealt with requirements and added features. And so 1.1 and 1.2 were, were major releases through last year. And then in February of this year, we finally reached graduated status within the CNCF. So there's about six projects in the CNCF that have now graduated, including, of course, Kubernetes itself and several others. And so that's kind of a basic timeline of, of Container D's uh, coming to life. And really, that initial idea was, if we have this core container runtime uh, that's, that's more vendor neutral, then Docker can continue to innovate and add their features and capabilities to the Docker engine. Kubernetes can continue to innovate and not worry about always trying to figure out how to sync up with Docker releases. And then Docker Swarm, which was Docker's orchestrator, can continue to innovate in their own way uh, as part of the Docker engine. And everyone can hopefully happily sit on top of Container D and no more big disagreements uh, in the industry. And so, again, last year, our integration with Containerd, so that means our CRI implementation, impl implementation that, that, that took those API requirements and called into Containerd to actually do those functions on behalf of Kubernetes, uh, that went GA last year. Um, and so there's been kind of a steady uh, adoption rate since then as we've continued to mature the project. And so here's a bunch of logos. I used to have a, a list, but as the, the projects have increased, it's easier just to show the logos and make a few comments. Um, so again, a couple major clouds, Google's GKE and IBM Cloud Kubernetes service both uh, use Containerd today. In the IBM case, it's in production. Every cluster you create in our Kubernetes service will use Containerd. Uh, GKE has Containerd in beta, so when you create a cluster, you can select Containerd as the runtime but if you don't, it defaults to Docker still today, and I think they're on a path in 2019 to move fully to Containerd. Um, again, Docker and, and Docker projects continue to rely on Containerd as part of that stack that I showed you in an early picture. One of the largest users of Containerd is Alibaba Cloud in China. They have an a open source project you can find on GitHub called Pouch Container. Um, that uses Containerd as their runtime, but also uses the API and the client library in a lot of interesting ways. Uh, so they actually have maintainers in the Containerd project now from Alibaba who've been uh, great uh, additions to the community. Um, this whole area over here on the upper right is all those lightweight virtualizers. Again, their use of Containerd as 
allows them to be pluggable into Kubernetes without writing their own CRI. So that means with this special runtime class feature of Kubernetes, I could use CADA, I could use Google's Gvisor, or IBM Research's Nabla containers, uh, or Amazon's Firecracker. All these are available to me now um, by using Containerd as the runtime and using runtime class to point to different specialty runtimes. There's some interest in Containerd in kind of the operating system space with Linux Kit, using Containerd to run its core services, a rancher, and uh, if you've heard of uh, K3S, sort of a cut down Kubernetes, and now K3OS, uh, that all, those all use Containerd as the runtime. And then there's a little bit of interest in the IoT space, again, a lightweight, smaller runtime in, in a few projects as well. The one thing I haven't mentioned, actually two things I haven't mentioned, Kind, the Kubernetes and Docker tool, just switched to Containerd, I think in the last week or two, in their GitHub project. There's not a release yet that uses Containerd, but their uh, master branch has already switched. And then Cloud Foundry has always had a container runtime, you know, pre-existing kind of the Docker and Kubernetes craze. Um, we've been working with the Cloud Foundry team. We have contributors at IBM who first switched to Run C and now are switching to uh, Containerd as the runtime. So if you use Cloud Foundry Platform as a Service, when you start, when you CF push your application, um, that actually gets packaged as a container and in the future uh, can run on. Uh, today runs on Run C and in flight uh, will use Containerd as well. So this is kind of a, a broad view of kind of where Containerd is, who's using it, um, and obviously a, a, a broad set of adopters across the industry. So I'm going to use um, the next 10 minutes or so to try to show you more visually from, you know, sometimes the command line can be extremely boring. I hope I don't bore you to death. Uh, but I want to give you a picture of kind of these layers of, of how we talk to Kubernetes and then how the CRI and the runtime uh, work together on that. So I have a cluster on IBM Cloud. Uh, it's actually Kubernetes 1.14.1, which we just released. And it's using Containerd 1.2.6, which is the latest release, uh, latest official release of Containerd. Uh, but before I, I demo that, um, I, I've done this a few times, and I, and I feel like I jump in uh, too far without a good picture. So this is the picture I want you to have as I run some commands. Um, there's really, again, these three layers. So when we talk to Kubernetes, uh, hopefully if you've played around with Kubernetes, kubectl, or kubectl, however you like to say that, is a common uh, entry point to Kubernetes unless you're using some UI or web-based dashboard. Um, and in that case, you're talking directly to the Kubernetes API. And that, of course, drives the kubelet. Uh, when you want to talk to the CRI runtime, there's a, there's a tool, CryCuddle, that talks to the CRI API. And so again, on that chart where I showed Kubernetes responsibilities and the CRI responsibilities, um, we talked about um, that set of things that every CRI needs to do. And so the nice thing is if you learn the CryCuddle tool, it doesn't matter what runtime uh, your Kubernetes cluster uses. The crycuddle commands work against every CRI implementing runtime. And so that set of tools will, I think, will become more popular to operators of Kubernetes clusters because it allows you to not use Docker commands or CTR for Containerd. But again, because my cluster is running Containerd, we can also jump in and use the CTR tool and talk directly over the Containerd API to Containerd itself. And so that's kind of the, the three levels that uh, we'll talk to our Kubernetes cluster. And first, let me um, try and get this font somewhat visible. Someone tell me when they think it's large enough for everyone. Does that seem good? Let me get some output. That may help. Um, so assuming the Wi-Fi works, yes. So I'm talking to a three-node Kubernetes cluster. I just showed you kind of that static view of, of my um, Kubernetes 1.14.1 cluster. Actually, if I show uh, a wide view, which will probably wrap because, yeah, because of the font size. Uh, so it's a little ugly, 
Um, but the thing I wanted to point out is that it's actually listing the container runtime here as being container D 1.2.6. Again, my three nodes, uh, Ubuntu is the base OS there. Um, let me get another window here at a similar size. And the first thing I'm going to do, um, actually, we could also look at it this way. Uh, let me change the size there as well. So again, this is Kubernetes default dashboard. I obviously have um, my sort of IBM view, but IBM offers the, the standard Kubernetes dashboard as well. So I can see that, and I can see that at least in my default namespace, um, I, have, I have nothing running here. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, deploy uh, Nginx. And so I have a simple example that starts a pod, exposes it as service, and sets up ingress to, to my Nginx. So let me just deploy that. And so we'll get a deployment. Is this font reasonable back there? Readable? All right. The back row thumbed up, so I think we're good. Um, so at this point, I've only been interacting with the Kubernetes API. So again, this is kubectl. Um, you can see I now have, uh, I didn't show you my YAML, but I said five um, instances across my three nodes. And so hopefully uh, my dashboard will show that. I'm just going to refresh rather than wait for auto refresh. Um, so hopefully we'll see that, sure enough, I have an Nginx deployment, and I have um, five pods running here. It looks like uh, across my three nodes, uh, there's, for some reason, one node got three of them, and two of the other nodes each got one, and that's good because I only set up access to, uh, to one of those nodes, so we're going to actually use kube. Uh, cuddle exec. And I have a, a pod running in the kube system namespace. Actually, I just realized I better set that or else this isn't going to work. So I have a, a pod running in the kube system namespace, which is a bit of a hack to allow me to SSH directly onto the worker node. Otherwise, the demo is not all that exciting if I can't get there. So uh, this is obviously not something your system administrator wants you to do. Uh, but uh, at this point, you can see I have a, a shell inside a container. So I'm inside a pod, but it's a pod that has no security policy. And I've mucked around with the with the mounts and restarted SSH on the node so that I can SSH. And so I went from the pod, and now I'm actually sitting on the VM that's running kubect, uh, the, the uh, Kubernetes uh, kubelet. And let's see if we can kind of verify that. Yeah, the output's going to be ugly. So there's a kubelet running on this node. Um, just to make sure there's no man behind the curtain. There's no Docker running. Sorry, that's a little low. Uh, there's no Docker command installed. Uh, this is only running uh, container D. And this will also be ugly because, again, I'm, not, I'm, I'm only running Nginx, but there are many pods running because of, uh, actually, let's do a, a cry CTL command. So again, this is me talking to the CRI API. And I'll actually just ask what the list of pods are. So you can see my Nginx pod here. Uh, you can see my inspect node pod, which is the way I got access uh, I showed you a minute ago to SSH in. But IBM is using FluentD. We're using Calico. Uh, we have some proxies. And so again, there's many things already running on this node. And so CRI CTL allows me to start looking at that. And it's not limiting me to just the default namespace. You can actually see, again, sorry, we're large enough that it's wrapping, but you know, many of these are in kube system, IBM system, and only my Nginx pod is in the default uh, Kubernetes namespace. All right, so we use the Kubernetes API to actually deploy my pod. Um, we've looked at CRI, CTL, and I have no time at all to uh, show you all the possible things. Here's a little bit of the help, you know, inspecting, 
listing containers, pulling images. You can actually even start pods from the CRI API. And so actually you can think of CRI, CTL, as kind of a driver for runtimes. You could use this to, to test your CRI implementation without even having the rest of Kubernetes running, right? You could, you could start pods, stop pods, et cetera. So the CRI API gives you kind of a, uh, a focused way to just drive the runtime. So again, there's many, many commands. We won't have time to look at all of those. Uh, but again, um, I've already shown you that we have Nginx running. Uh, sorry, that's at the bottom. Let me move that up to the top. So we have Nginx running. It has a certain ID. And so I should be able to find, and actually this is a, I, I need to change my example because IBM is using Nginx for ingress. So we have all kinds of Nginx processes. But I know mine is this FCGI wrap uh, because uh, I haven't shown you yet, but I actually have a, a very simple index.html that just re responds back with the, um, the pod that, so if I refresh this, if I have five pods, ingress is just obviously round robining to, to all the different pods in my system. And so this is the FCGI um, process here. And so, so we've looked at Kubernetes API, creating the pod. We've looked at CRI CTL telling me about my pods and telling me I have such a pod. Now I'm going to use the CTR tool. And the first thing um, we have to understand, so I'm, I'm shortening commands, so I've got CTR, CLS. Let me clear the screen again. First of all, um, again, I mentioned this is version 126, so this is the client talking to the ContainerD server. Again, they're both at the same version. And if I do CTR containers, C is short for containers list, I get no containers. And that's because container D is actually namespaced, uh, similar to how Kubernetes is namespaced. And this is so that the container D runtime on this host could actually be used by other tools. So I could install Docker, and Docker could use this container D, and it would use the namespace Mobi. In, in our case, um, we only have a single namespace set up that ContainerD knows about called k8s.io, and that was a choice of the CRI implementations. CRI creates this namespace and then uses that. So now if I do ctr-namespace k8s.io cls, I get a ton of output, and it's very, very ugly because, again, being driven through the CRI, we're not passing down names, and, and so hashes are used everywhere for the names of containers, for the images, and so this is a bit ugly. But I can also look at the tasks. So if, if I again look at kds.io and do a T for tasks, ls, I get a list of, of, again, these are not pretty container names, but these are the actual containers that Cry Cuddle told us about. And now we can actually see PIDs. And hopefully, um, that FCGI wrap is 25671 is the PID. And so hopefully, we can find that. Sure enough, the very top row there, 5EA, that ends in 0BD. That's my actual container that, that again, Kubernetes said, put an Nginx pod here. Um, the CRI implementation told container D, hey, start an Nginx process, here's the image. And so now we have a running container with a running PID. And so if I cut and paste this, I'm going to inspect, again, I have to have the namespace. So I'm, I'm asking container D, what's the info on this uh, long, complicated hash container name? And sure enough, we can see some labels that help us kind of see what's happening here. We can actually map it to the pod name. It's an Nginx container. It's in the default Kubernetes namespace. And from here, we can actually start to see that it's using container D and run C, that it has a snapshot or using overlay FS, it has a certain set of layers. And then we can actually start to see the OCI spec. So again, what is a container? That's de decided uh, at the CRI layer. And so it actually knows the argument because it pulled the image and, and read that information and, of course, set up all the environment that's part of that image. 
<laughs> so again, fairly straightforward. We can, um, again, map all the way from Kubernetes pods through the CRI to a runtime. And again, for, for many of you, this is not something you'd ever really be all that interested to do, but my, my uh, hope here was to see the connection between these layers of the stack and how, how they're all working together. Uh, we have a few more minutes uh, before we even have five minutes for questions. So one of the things we could do here, just to kind of show how Kubernetes uh, starts to uh, manage um, processes, we could kill this container, right? So we could kill this process. The pod isn't killed, just my container, as if it crashed. So hopefully Kubernetes will restart uh, just that container, the pod will, will remain the same. And so um, we are going to do a task. And I'm actually going to, I wrote a horrible image for this container. It doesn't handle signals properly. So I'm going to actually kill with like sig kill uh, this container. And I just realized I forgot the actual kill command after typing all that. So task kill, and now if we do um, <coughs> kube cuddle get pods, you'll see that the xtgxd, which we saw in the output of that inspect, has a restart of one. So again, if we go back to our browser, uh, we better still see xt, yep, it just showed up again. So again, Kubernetes handled that. It told um, container D to restart the nginx container. If we step up a level, we can actually stop the pod and kill the pod. And now Kubernetes has to reset all of that. And so if I do, um, sorry, not kubectl, if I go over here and I do, I'm going to list my pods again. And I'm going to actually use this pod ID and do a CRI CTL stop pod and that ID, and then a R remove pod and that ID. So there I've just actually killed the entire pod in Kubernetes, which meant it also killed the containers in it. Um, and so hopefully, now the problem, I don't know if this is a recent change to Kubernetes, but um, you'll see that there's no more restarts listed for XTG XD. It used to actually create a new pod ID, but now it actually just reuses it. Uh, but as you can see, there's brand new containers with different PIDs. So if we, if we go back and we look at uh, my FCGI process, it's now a totally different PID, 2555. If we look at the CTR um, task list, <coughs> Yeah, it scrolled off, on, or no, here it is, 2555. So again, the container is restarted, the pod is restarted, and I think uh, we could even see in the, uh, if we go to that pod in the Kubernetes dashboard, oh my, I left this running and I've timed out my uh, dashboard. So at this point, uh, I've used up my 40 minutes, so I will bring that up, but uh, let's just look at that briefly and you should actually see in the history of that pod, you should see an actual pod restart, just verifying that Kubernetes um, did the right thing. So pod sandbox changed. Oops, that's, sorry, that's very small. Um, so it actually created new containers and, and restarted everything. So again, uh, the general idea there was just to give you an idea of how these layers are working together. There's tons of more information that you can find. I'll share these slides on SlideShare, but I think at, at this point we can probably go to some questions and see if there's anything um, that you guys wanted to ask. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right, we have one question. Are those runtimes completely interchangeable? Um, so if you're, if we're talking about the Kubernetes abstraction layer, yes. I mean, if you're only caring about, I'm going to use the Kubernetes API, my applications are not going to think about how to interact with the runtime, the, then yes. Um, it really depends on the runtime's capabilities 
And again, the Kubernetes CRI abstraction is what sets up the requirements for the runtime. And so if Kubernetes has a way to allocate GPUs, then CRI runtimes, all of them, have to implement that. Um, and so, yeah, at that level, they should be very, very pluggable. Uh, where interesting things happen is that people write software and get stuck and figure out a way to actually, you know, exec out and try and use Docker commands, because I know every Kubernetes cluster runs Docker, right? Well, uh, you know, even as we migrated our IBM cloud from Docker to ContainerD, we found all kinds of tools, and, and again, we had to work with all our vendors who wrote um, third-party integrations with Kubernetes, who again, depended on the Docker engine or something sitting under it that they could filter on the API, so tools like Twistlock or Datadog. Um, so again, there, there are migration uh, things you have to consider if you have anything that's not built perfectly on the Kubernetes abstraction. Um, but yes, if you're building applications, they use the Kubernetes API, then you can fully interchange um, the, uh, the runtimes without any issue. But again, people have built with the expectation of Docker being there forever, and so there are potential pain points around that if you're, if you're again, integrating at any other layer. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you oh. so much. Okay, one last. What do you know? I'm having trouble parsing that question. I don't know if anyone else is. Um, so I don't know if there's a rewording of that that would help. Um, so again, I, I don't know if this is speaking about how I, I showed the Kubernetes API, the CRI API, and runtimes. Um, and, and if there's other pieces around that, I'm not sure. So sorry about that. If you're here and you want to ask me that directly, I'm happy to try and answer it. OK, thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, this is a little gift for your wonderful, like uh, with the awesome. portrait of you. So thank, thank you. you so much for your wonderful presentation.